Uh, grab your Bibles, turn over to Luke uh, chapter 18. That's where we are going to be this morning, uh, in Luke chapter 18. In this chapter, we read the story of a blind man. A blind man who, was in, who actually inspired others uh, because of the great transformation that Jesus uh, gave into his life. Uh, so I want to jump in. We're gonna, uh, my prayer is that we allow Jesus to touch the eyes of our souls and the eyes of our hearts as we look at this blind man's condition and his uh, petition and then finally his transformation. I pray that our eyes would be open, that we can see the light, come into the light of Jesus Christ. Jump down to verse 35. Verse 35, we read this, Luke chapter 18. As Jesus approached Jericho, a blind man was sitting by the roadside begging. Now, let's stop there for a moment. Mark's gospel identifies this man as Bartimaeus. His name is Bartimaeus. Um, Another gospel uh, says there were two men that were actually healed that day. He had a companion. And so... um, uh, I can only imagine, maybe you could too, how tragic it would be to go blind. Anybody ever lose their sight for a brief time? I'm just kind of curious. Anybody? I don't see anybody out there. So I've never been blind, but I can only imagine what it would be like. Bartimaeus here uh, obviously was not born blind. He had, at, at some point in his life, it looks like he lost his sight. Could you imagine losing your sight, not being able to see your kids' faces? Not, I wouldn't be able to see my kids play soccer. You know, uh, I wouldn't be able to enjoy the beauty of God's creation, whether it's in the woods or on the beach somewhere. I mean, I, I just the tragedy of going blind to me would be so huge. I, I don't know how I would deal with that. And here's Bartimaeus, not the 21st century like today, but way back in the first century, who has gone blind at some some time in his life. And you think about there were no telephones, there were no. Uh, sidewalks to serve as guides to reach your destination. There, was, there were no seeing eye dogs. There were no books on tape, no braille, no computers. Um, and, and I can imagine that, blind, that people were very insensitive to blind people in their plight. In fact, they probably looked down on them back then. And uh, of course, there was no government assistance. And so Bartimaeus, here's, here he is blind. A blind person would have to sit and do what Bartimaeus was doing, sitting by the roadside and begging just for a handout so he could survive. Not a very effective life, I could imagine. But I think about physical blindness on the one hand, and I think there's actually something worse than physical blindness, and that would be spiritual blindness. Not being able to see the light of Jesus Christ. Uh, 2 Corinthians 4.4, it says this, The God of this age. Who's the God of this age? Satan, thank you. (laughs) The God of this age, and he's talking about Satan, the devil, Lucifer, okay, has, look at this, blinded the minds of unbelievers. You agree with that? He's got them, he's got unbelievers where he wants them. Everything is okay, right? It says so that they cannot see the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. Satan has done a number on the world these days, from beginning of time, really, but he has blinded people to see what's really true, to see what's really right. Uh, You've heard expressions like, you know, you're so blind, you can't see what's going on right in front of you, right? You've heard that. Uh (laughs) Uh-huh. Been there. You know, your child's on drugs, you can't even see that. Your, your husband is being unfaithful, and you don't even know it. You're blind to it. Uh, you, you, she loves you, and you can't even see it. You know, we've used that phrase, and, and it's really true of how Satan interacts with us in blinding the world from the light of truth. A college girl brought her boyfriend home to meet her parents, and uh, he had this orange spiked hair, numerous body piercings and tattoos, and I don't know, nowadays maybe that's not so, whoa, uh, but, but way back when it sure it was. Well, the concerned mother took her daughter aside and she asked her, is he nice? Is he kind? And of course, the daughter said, well, of course he's nice, you know. If, if he wasn't nice, why else would he be doing 500 hours of community service? <laughs> Love is blind, right? <laughs> Love is blind. We, Satan blinds us from the, the realities of life. Romans chapter 11 and verse 8, it speaks of a people who are in a spiritual stupor. 
They don't understand it. They, they, they don't have eyes to be able to see spiritual things, ears to hear spiritual things. Uh, they're, they're just blind to it. They have eyes to see but do not see spiritually. People who are spiritually blind, now I'm going to kind of go through uh, a few phrases, so write these in your notes. First of all, people who are spiritual, spiritually blind, they don't understand the light. They don't understand what this is about. They don't understand Christianity. They don't understand Jesus Christ. They don't understand the truth. They're blind to it. Satan has blinded them to these things. In John 1, 5, we read, uh, the light shines in the darkness, but the darkness has not understood it. So opening chapter of John. Jesus has come into the darkness, but the, the darkness, the people who are living in the dark, they don't go, huh? I don't get it. They, they, they read the Bible, and they just can't comprehend it. They hear a sermon or a message, and they sit there and go, it kind of goes over their heads. Uh, People living in spiritual darkness hear uh, about sin and they hear about this Savior who can save them from their sin and, and, and they hear about being born again and, and they just they hear it so much but it never really sinks in. They can't comprehend it. The light shines in the darkness but they just don't get it. Perhaps they're not intellectually capable. Maybe, uh, maybe they're just not interested or, or maybe they're just too embarrassed to ask about it. But whatever the case, really, it comes down to one thing, and that is Satan has blinded these people's eyes to spiritual truth. So they can't see Jesus Christ. They can't see the Savior. They can't see that Jesus died for them and wants to forgive them and empower them to live forever in heaven. 1 Corinthians 2.14. Here's another kind of neat verse. 1 Corinthians 2.14, it says, The man without the Spirit does not accept the things that come from the Spirit of God. For they're foolishness to him, and he cannot understand them because they're spiritually discerned. People living in the world can't spiritually discern other things, Christian Christian things. They don't belong to God. They can't, they just, spiritual things, they just can't comprehend. Okay? I think Satan's done a number on this world. Don't you agree? You look at the evil around, my goodness, you just go, holy mackerel, he's got people, I, I, just, he's got them nailed down. He makes them blind to the truth of God can't, so they can't understand it. Here's the second one. He gets them to actually hate the light. He takes it one, a, a step further. He gets people to actually hate the light, to hate Christianity. Jesus says in John chapter 3, this is the verdict. Light has come into the world, but men loved darkness instead of light because their deeds were evil. And everyone who does evil hates the light and will not come into the light for fear that his deeds will be exposed. They hate the light. (laughs) You know what it's like to be sound asleep in your room and lights are out and your wife comes in and turns on the lights. What do you do? You kind of you try to open your eyes, but it hurts, you know, and you squint, and you're like, you, you throw the covers back over your head, and, and you're like, honey, turn it out. Please, I hate it. That's how the people of the world are. Spiritually, people who are living in darkness, they hate the truth. They can't stand it. Does that make sense? You know, they, they get angry at the exposure of the truth in life. They, and so they'll say things like, well, America, it, it really wasn't born on religious freedom. They turn the light out on that, and they rewrite history. They lie. They, they get angry, and uh, they say, well, if there were a God, why would all these bad things happen? So they turn the light out on a, on a loving God, and they get angry at Him. Uh, they, they say, take down the Ten Commandments from, from that courtroom or that city square because we don't want you shoving religion down our throats. And so they turn the light out on truth because they don't want their evil deeds to be exposed. And they get all bent out of shape and, 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 and just become angry and they end up hating Christians. And so I like what Plato once said. Plato once said, we can easily forgive a child who is afraid of the dark. Then he said, the real tragedy of life is when men are afraid of the light. That's a tragedy, to be afraid of the light. Here's another one. People who are spiritually blind don't know where they're going. They don't know where they're going. Uh, That's so funny. My son, we were in the car the other day, and he asked me, how do blind people get around? How do they know where to go? And I'm like, well, they just do. They have this sense. But really, they don't know where they're going. They, They usually have to be guided by somebody. In John 12, 35, Jesus said to his disciples, you're going to have the light just a little while longer. And he says, walk while you have the light before darkness overtakes you. 
He says, the man who walks in the dark does not know where he is going. He points it right out. They don't know where they're going. So when people are in spiritual darkness, they're groping for any kind of light, any kind of meaning, any kind of handle that will give meaning uh, to the light that they actually can find. And here's what I mean. Remember, how many, remember the, maybe some of you participated in this, the feng, the feng shui, am I saying it right? Feng shui craze a number of years ago. <laughs> Feng shui, you know, getting all the stuff organized in your home in a proper way. Well, this feng shui, shui, I can't even say it. In Mandarin, it means uh, wind and water. And the idea was that all buildings and landscapes and layouts in your rooms and, and, and uh, homes and passageways and colors, all of these things are conduits for spiritual energy. And so if you got the feng shui right in your home, then the idea was that you were you were going to have success. It was inevitable that you were going to be successful. And so homeowners started making sure their feng shui was right in their homes. And, and, and get this, large corporations began hiring feng shui consultants to come in and help them out, like Universal Studios and Merrill Lynch. They were hiring consultants to come in so they could get their spiritual energy right. And I, I find that interesting because people living in darkness... People who are not connected to Jesus Christ, who are not connected to the church, who are not connected to Christianity, these people are so desperate to find some kind of meaning in life that they'll go leaps and bounds to make sure their furniture is organized properly in their home so they have spiritual uh, uh, meaning. G.K. Chesterton once said, when a person quits believing in God, he doesn't believe in it and nothing. In fact, he believes in anything. Maybe the opposite of Christianity, the opposite of Christianity is not atheism. Maybe it's actually superstition. It's superstition. Charles Colson wrote about this feng shui craze that was going on a number of years ago, and he said this, Disconnected from the truth, they embrace any belief that provides answers, no matter how naive or silly. What all this really shows is our culture's confusion born out of its abandonment of biblical faith. You think our culture has abandoned biblical faith? You don't have to look very far, do you? We've kind of given it up. So they're relying on superstitions and feng shui to get their spiritual energy right so they can have success in life. There's only one man I know to get success from, and that's Jesus Christ. There's nothing superstition about that. That's faith. Satan has gotten people to live in darkness. So they don't understand it. They hate it. Uh, they don't know where they're going. Here's one that's surprising to me. I, I just, this one this is a head scratcher. <laughs> Here it is. They get other people to follow them. Write that in your notes. They get other people to follow them. I don't get that. In uh, Matthew 15, Jesus calls the Pharisees blind guides. They got people to follow them to doing all the religious things that really didn't amount to much. And I don't know how they did it. But Jesus said, if a blind man leads a blind man, both will fall into a pit. That makes sense. Blind man leads a blind man, they're going to end up destroying themselves. They're going to end up hurt. Something's going to go wrong. It seems strange that people who don't know where they're going are also able to persuade other people to follow them. Have you ever followed somebody who didn't know where he or she was going? That's not fun. (laughs) <laughs> but we keep going. Maybe they'll figure it out, right? That's our thoughts. A few weeks ago, Dawn and I were watching television. We came across uh, a, a, a show called Truth and Lies. I don't know if maybe you've, you've seen it, this show. Uh, but that night they had on, do you remember, um, oh, why can't I name his name? David Koresh, Branch Davidian, Waco, Texas. Remember that from, I don't know, 93, I think it was. We're watching this show about David Koresh and Somehow, this guy gets dozens of people, something like 80, 90 people, to follow him to this compound where they all live together under some really strange rules because of bad theology of the Bible. And I'm scratching my head. Ultimately, David Koresh led most of them to their death. Uh, They ended up going in and blowing it up, and he blew himself up. I don't know. There's going to be a movie series about it coming out this week. But I'm I'm sitting here watching this show, and (laughs) how many times did I ask, Dawn? How does somebody like David Koresh get people to follow him? I don't understand. It doesn't make sense. Dude was weird. But I read this. Um, 
It's the blind leading the blind. William Jones once said this. Maybe this is the answer. There is no idea so absurd that if it's repeated often enough, people will come to believe it. That's it. It's the blind leading the blind. The blind are blind, and the, and the blind leader is blind, so let's get together and have a big party and kill ourselves. I, I don't know. It's crazy. But those who are spiritually blind, they don't understand the light. They, they just don't get it. They hate it. They hate the light. They don't know where they're going, and they get other people to follow them. It just happens. Bartimaeus, uh, he's, he's physically he's physically blind, and one day he gets to make a desperate plea to Jesus Christ. Look at verse 36. When he heard the crowd uh, going by, he asked what was happening, obviously. And so they told him, verse 37, Jesus of Nazareth is passing by. Now, I can only imagine at this point the hope that's growing in Bartimaeus's heart. You know, I imagine Bartimaeus probably, he had, had to have heard about Jesus he had heard that Jesus was coming to town, maybe, and, but he knew that Jesus, since he's been here, he has healed people. He's made the lame to walk. He's made the deaf to hear. He's made, made a couple blind men see. He's healed leprosy. Jesus can do something for Bartimaeus. He, now he has an opportunity to see again. And Jesus was coming into town unexpectedly, unannounced, and this could make all the difference in the world for him. So I want to talk about coming into the light, this next section, uh, coming into the light. The first step in the coming into spiritual light is this. You've got to recognize the opportunity that's at hand. Recognize the opportunity that's at hand. And maybe, maybe God has come unexpectedly in your life. He just kind of showed up in some way. Maybe you went to see a couple spiritual movies this year. The Shack, that was pretty good. The Star, you took your kids to see the Star, your grandkids to see the Star, and you're like, wow. And maybe, maybe your spiritual eyes are starting to open because of some of these seeds being planted in your life. Uh, maybe you started dating someone who has spiritual depth, and they're, they're helping you to be able to see the light a little brighter. Uh, maybe, maybe a friend invited you to come to church, and you're like, yeah, I'll go check it out. And now, uh, out of curiosity, now you're figuring, hey, man, maybe this actually could be true. This is how God works. He plants these seeds and, and He puts opportunity in your path so that you can come into the light. Paul tells us in Colossians 4, 5, he says, make the most of every opportunity. And well, we should. So Bartimaeus, he sees the chance and he calls out to Jesus for mercy. I find this passage interesting. Luke 18, 38, look what it says. Uh, in verse 38, he called out, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Now there's a lot going on in this one verse. All right. First of all, he calls Jesus the son of David. That's interesting because son of David is a prophecy about the coming Messiah. So think about what's happening. Bartimaeus calls Jesus son of David. So that means Bartimaeus recognizes and identifies Jesus Christ as the Messiah, the anointed one of God. He knows who Jesus is. That's pretty cool. And what does he do? He pleads for mercy. You know what mercy is? Mercy is this. It's exemption from deserved punishment. Exemption from deserved punishment. Anybody deserve punishment in this room? Mm -hmm. How'd you like to be exempted from that? That'd be nice. And so Bartimaeus, that's what he's pleading for. Punishment for what? Sin. The sin in his life. He knew he was a bad person. He'd done things wrong. And he pleads to the Messiah, have mercy on me. Exempt me from the punishment that I deserve. That's pretty interesting. Think about it. The, the rich young ruler that we studied last week, this is totally opposite, right? Bartimaeus didn't come with pompousness. He wasn't wealthy. He didn't have anything. He didn't demand Jesus to heal him because he had kept all the commandments, right? Right? He knew that he was asking for something he didn't deserve because he's a sinner. That's Bartimaeus. So how do, how do we do this? Well, the second one is this. You've got to start with honesty. When you come to God, you've got to start with honesty and, and just be real. Bartimaeus didn't claim to deserve the healing. I think as Christians, sometimes we think we feel entitled. God, why don't you do this for me? I've been following you all these years. And we get this entitlement mentality. That's wrong. We don't deserve anything. We deserve death and hell and punishment. So, uh, 
Bartimaeus pleaded for mercy. Please help me. One of the initial steps in coming to Jesus and letting the light shine is to be honest in our admission of sin and our need for forgiveness. We can't con God with our good works. We can't con God with our status in society, and that doesn't matter to Him. We can only come to Him and admit to God, you know what, Lord, I have sinned. I've fallen short of Your glory. I've fallen short of Your will. I've been spiritually blind, and I need mercy. Exempt me from uh, deserved punishment. Verse 39, those who led the way rebuked Him, and they told Him to be quiet. But I love what happens. He shouted all the more. Son of David, have mercy on me. He shouted all the more. I love that. When you begin to come into the light of Jesus, you know what's going to happen? People are going to try to hold you back, right? They're going to say, what are you going to church for? You know, what are you reading the Bible for? You don't need God. He doesn't even exist. You know, they're going to try to hold you back. They're going to try to uh, keep you from getting to Jesus Christ. They're going to try to prevent it. But Bartimaeus, here it is. I love Bartimaeus. He goes to extremes here. He would not be denied. He doubles his efforts. All right, here's the next step. Persevere despite opposition. You keep going after it. You keep trying to find the truth. You keep trying to get closer to Jesus. You keep going to church. You keep reading your Bible. You keep doing all these things no matter what, what, what other else is going on around you. Friends holding you back, temptations that are coming. You just try to you, you keep your eyes fixed on Jesus. You persevere despite the opposition. I love that Jesus... Um, honors his perseverance, of course, in verse 40. So Jesus stopped, and he ordered the man to be brought to him. Don't you love Jesus? I think that's great. He doesn't, rec- he doesn't resist a- this cry for mercy, right? He can't. He can't resist a cry for mercy. And for a brief moment in time, this blind beggar has the undivided attention of the one who lit the sky with the sun, moon, and stars, and planets, and everything else. If he could light the sky with that, he could light the eyes of a blind beggar, right? He's got his attention. So Jesus calls the man over and <clears throat> Jesus says, what do you want me to do for you? Don't you love it? Don't you, I, don't you love Jesus, man? I, he, never, he never forced his will and his power on people, right? He, he was always so gentle with those who were seeking him. And here he asks, what can I do for you? How can I help you? The Son of God becomes a servant to a blind beggar, and he says, how can I help you? What can I do? So then Bartimaeus, here's the next one, requested specific assistance from Jesus. He gets downright specific, right? What's he say? Verse 41, Lord, I want to see. I want to see. A man named Ken Geyer wrote this. He says, Jesus knew what those four short words meant. It meant, I want out of the dungeon of, of this darkness. I want to get off the roadside. I want to walk the streets of Jericho without running into walls. I want to look in the shops. I want to find my way to the synagogue. I want to use my hands for something besides feeling my way in the dark. I want to fix my own meals. I want to give... Somebody act, uh, across, I, want to, I want to wave at somebody across the way. I want to read. I want to smile at children, pat their heads, and wish them well. Lord, I want to see. It had so much meaning for blind Bartimaeus. And I want to say this. If, if, if we're going to be transformed by the Lord from darkness to light, it's helpful in our lives to specifically uh, ask what needs to be changed to specify exactly what needs to be changed in our lives. If Jesus were to come to you and say to you today, how can I help you? What would your answer be? What do you need to change? What would you say? Jesus, I want stronger faith. Remove all my doubts. Or Lord, I I need more courage. I, I want to quit blindly catering to other people's opinions of me. Or I want to be sober, God. Take away my dark addictions. Lord, I need to change. I want to love my family, so take away the blinders and, and help me see the good that's in my family and my wife and my, or my husband or my kids. Father, uh, I, I want you to remove the darkness of my sins and the blindness in my eyes so I can come to spiritual truth. Bartimaeus made his point uh, Pretty, pretty specific. He made a bold petition. He simply says, Lord, I want to see. 
I need to be changed. And I know you can help me. And so, Bartimaeus, in this last section, he experiences this dramatic transformation. In verse 42, we read this. I love these two verses. Two verses. Jesus said to him, Receive your sight. Your faith has healed you. So immediately he received his sight and followed Jesus, praising God. Now look at this. When all the people saw it, what did they do? They praised the Lord too. Isn't that great? Now, we'll get into that. Now, here's a couple things going on in this verse, in these two verses. This is so cool. In the Greek, receive your sight is only one word. Literally translated, see. It takes just one single word for Jesus to perform a miracle. Isn't that exciting? One word, and he was immediately healed. And, and, and so, in the twinkling of an eye, Bartimaeus went from darkness to light. And I think the first thing that he saw, it was not the buildings of Jericho. It was not the clear blue sky with the puffy white clouds. It was not the amazed faces of the crowd. It wasn't the dirt on the road. You know, the first thing I think Bartimaeus saw was the smiling face of Jesus Christ. Yeah, that's the first thing I'd want to see. The first thing he saw was the tenderness and love in the eyes of a king. Isn't that great? That's what Bartimaeus saw. It was amazing. And so here's, here's what happens to Bartimaeus, okay? He goes from sitting along the roadside in boredom to this life of excitement, enthusiasm. Jesus changed his life, transformed it from boredom to excitement and enthusiasm. His life had been very uneventful. I imagine that Bartimaeus uh, was there over the next few, day, few days of Jesus' life. Think about that. What happens in the next few days in Jesus' life? It gets pretty exciting. He gets to see Jesus ride into to the city of Jerusalem uh, triumphantly, the triumphal entry, right? He gets to see Jesus go into the temple and turn over the tables of the money changers. Good times. That's pretty exciting. He gets to see Lazarus probably raised from the dead. Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead. You know what else he gets to see? He gets to see Jesus be crucified on the cross. But then three days later, rise from the dead. He gets to see some pretty cool stuff. This is neat. His, his life goes from boredom to excitement. And if you allow Jesus Christ to transform your life and, and you've stayed close to him, you've probably seen some incredible events, seen him bring some incredible events into your life. Now, the world doesn't understand this. People living in darkness, they don't understand this, uh, but some of the most exciting and unforgettable ha events happen in the gathering of God's people. Are anybody with me on that? Oh, man, great things happen when God's people get together. Now, I want to tell you something. I've traveled all over the place. I've seen some pretty cool stuff. I've seen the stars on Hollywood Boulevard. I've seen the snow-capped mountains in Montana. I've seen Niagara Falls. That's pretty cool. I've seen New York City. I've seen the beautiful beaches of Punta Cana. I've seen some really cool stuff, and I'm sure you have too. It's been worth talking about. I was at the game when Michael Jordan made the shot. Yeah, not a good day. But I was there. I could say, man, I saw that. I got to see Michael Jordan make the shot over Craig Elo. I was sitting way up in the nosebleed section. But I was there. It was really cool. Uh, I've been to Cleveland Browns games. I've never seen them win at home, all right? I've, I've been to Cleveland Indians games. I've seen them win a lot. It's been great. I've seen some pretty cool stuff. Now, listen to this. In college, I got to sing. I got to sing on Carnegie Hall stage in New York City. That was pretty cool. To stand on that stage and look out and see that hall, I mean, it's just amazing. I've seen some pretty cool stuff. I've been, I've been in all kinds of places. I've been to concerts and done great things uh, in my life. But you know what? My favorite times in life, my most memorable experience, come right here in this place with God's people. Hands down. When I get to sing with you like we did this morning, man, I'm moved. The Holy Spirit moves, and I remember that. In college, when we would have uh, 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 worship gatherings, it was just amazing. These are the times that, that really, uh, for me, bring meaning in life. For people living in darkness, they don't understand it. They're living for all that other stuff. For me, everything else that happens in life are byproducts because we follow Jesus Christ. They don't get that. When you follow Jesus and the light comes on, you find excitement and joy and meaning in life. That's what it comes down to. Okay. Here's the other one transformation that took place. Bartimaeus went from being insignificant to 
influencing others. I love that passage in verse 43. When the people saw what was happening, they joined in, praising God. If we allow Jesus to transform us, He will use us as a light to draw people to Himself. John 8, 12, Jesus said, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. We've got the light within us. Matthew 5, 16, He takes it further. He says, In the same way, let your light shine before men that they may see your good deeds and praise your Father in heaven. Here's, here's kind of a strange thing. I've, I've experienced this many times in my life. Uh, the spiritually blind, they don't understand the light. Sometimes they even hate the light. But you know what? They're still drawn to it. You know what I mean? Like people living in darkness, people who are, don't go to church or whatever, they, they're still curious about it. I've had people in my life ask me, well, what about Jesus? Tell me about your church. Do you know? And I, and I know they don't want to have anything to do with it but they're still drawn to it. In the summertime, if we leave our porch light on, you know what happens? All these bugs show up out of the darkness. <laughs> the moths and mosquitoes, right? We open the door, what happens? They fly in because there's more light inside. They love the light. They come in out of the darkness because there's light. If, if I want the moths to come, I don't have to stand on the back porch and do a mating call. What's that look like anyway for a moth? I, I don't know. You don't need a mating call. You just turn the light on and they come right? They come out of the darkness. I've read that, you know, those bug zappers people buy and they put in their backyard. I've read, you know, they kill, they're actually, <laughs> they're actually counterproductive. You know, they might kill hundreds of bugs. That, they actually attract thousands of others of bugs. <laughs> so here's the ideal situation. Move next door to somebody who has a bug zapper in his backyard. Bugs love the light. They come in out of the darkness. And Graham Lotz wrote this, Moths in the midst of darkness are not attracted to the light. They are hungry for the light. They're hungry for it. She says people today living in the midst of darkness are not attracted to more darkness. She says strangely, they are attracted to the light. They are. So here's the message. Let your light shine. Your life for Jesus Christ has to, be, has to shine. Don't be ashamed of it, even when they hate it, even when they don't understand it, even if you don't have a dramatic testimony or spectacular things to say. Just let people see the difference that Jesus has made in your life, and they'll be drawn to it. Plain and simple. I'm going to close with, look at this verse, 1 Peter 2.9. You are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to God. This is so cool. Here's your identity. Here's your identity. You're chosen, you're royal, you're holy, and you are a child of God. What else do you need? That's who you are. So what's your purpose? Easy. Read the rest of it. That you may declare the praises of Him who called you out of where? Into where? It's wonderful light. Plain and simple. Let your light shine.